Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga series, the book that changed my life. We are on the seventh episode covering the second chapter of the book. We are on the seventh paragraph. So we have already seen in this last two episodes of this chapter the three steps of nature, briefly the three evolutionary steps of nature. The first step is what has already been established, the bodily life, where matter and life energy has been established in a working balance where living body, living material body in a stable condition has been established by evolution and it is flexible, adaptable, it can learn. And upon this foundation, the second stage of evolution, the second step of nature, the evolution of the mind is unfolding. And Sri Aurobindo has touched upon the three levels of the mind. One is this mind enmeshed in life and body and its activities limited by that. Second is when the mind liberates itself from its bondage to the bodily life and senses and become the pure intellect that can go beyond these limitations and create a greater possibility. And the third level of mind is divine ranges that are yet to be established. They are still rare examples here and there. And Sri Aurobindo insists that the first foundation that has been laid, the bodily life, the sthula sharira, composed of pranamaya and annamaya koshas, they themselves are not to be discarded as we go into the higher levels of evolution. There are possible perfection, divine perfection of these two layers. And integral yoga must contain these possibilities. Then he is coming to the mind and its evolution that is the ongoing journey where nature is looking at the current uh, evolutionary stage of the mind, pushing the limits of the mind and bringing that into a wider possession of humanity. So now let's take on the seventh paragraph of this chapter. You will find the link to this chapter in the description. I highly recommend you look at those texts so that we can travel together in this journey. So here is the beginning of the seventh paragraph. The mental life thus evolving in man is not indeed a common possession. Now, this is very important for us to understand. We are mental beings. Human beings are mental beings. Potentially capable of mastering bodily life. But this mental capacity is not yet a common possession among the entire humanity. In actual appearance, it would seem as if it were only developed to the fullest in individuals and as if there were great numbers and even the majority in whom it is either a small and ill-organized part of their normal nature or not evolved at all, or latent and not easily made active. So, billions of people on earth, we all have the similar mold of the body, bodily life, but the mind that is evolving in it is at different stages of development. That full capacity of a developed intellect 
is not yet a common possession. Vast majority are still at a very early stages of its development, ill-organized, yet to emerge in its full potential. That's why when it is not sufficiently organized, the mental life is limited. People would live in their bodily life where driven by life impulses and its cravings and its demands. Life gets bound within those limits, pretty much close to the animal life, where it is all about eating, mating, procreating, playing, sleeping. The survival level of existence is still the vast majority's situation. However, we can see that there is a rapid expansion of mental capacity with the development of internet and education and widespread growth of the mind across the planet. Now in the making, a rapid progress. So in actual appearance, it would seem as if it were only developed to the fullest in individuals and as if there were great numbers and even the majority in whom it is either a small and ill-organized part of their normal nature or not evolved at all or latent and not easily made active. The intellectual capacity is there but latent. It's a potentiality, not yet a manifest capacity. Just like a seed is a latent potential of a tree. It's only when it is manifest the tree become an actual living reality. So the intellectual capacity, the mental development is a potentiality in the individual, but it is visibly manifest only in a small section of humanity. Certainly the mental life is not a finished evolution in nature. So thus we can conclude that this is not a finished stage of evolution in nature. The mental life is not a finished evolution in nature. Unlike the bodily life, it has been well established and stabilized and made durable. Whereas the mental life is an ongoing process. It is not, it is not yet firmly founded in the human animal. The human animal. We are pretty much animal-like in vast majority of our impulsions and activities, propensities, a small majority able to go beyond it. The sign is that the fine and full equilibrium of vitality and matter, the sane, robust, long-lived human body is ordinarily found only in races or classes of men who reject the effort of thought, its disturbances, its tensions, or think only with their material mind. So that on one hand, when this bodily life is well stabilized and established, and we can see that communities, groups of people where intellectual culture has not yet entered, they have that stable, healthy, robust physical life. It is when the intellectual life enters, imbalance starts, because it is still an ongoing process of evolution, not yet established. So such a robust, healthy physique and life is visible commonly where there is this, what he is calling the only in the races or classes of men who reject the effort of thought, its disturbances, its tensions, because the mind brings its complex creative possibilities and related tensions and anxieties and disturbances. Because the mind itself is sufficient to create worries or think only with the material mind, like if you are only tied to your material mind and senses and bodily life, live like pretty much like an animal, you stay healthy. But 
the moment your mental life accelerates, mental growth accelerates, the disturbances tend to step in. So that's a sign that the mental evolution is not yet a finished stage in evolution. Certainly, mental life is not a finished evolution of nature. It is not yet firmly founded in the human animal. The sign is that the fine and full equilibrium, the fine and full equilibrium of vitality and matter, the sane, robust, long-lived human body is ordinarily found only in races or classes of men who reject the effort of thought, its disturbances, its tensions, or think only with the material mind. Civilized man has yet to establish an equilibrium between the fully active mind and the body. He does not normally possess it. So we have these stories of people who are highly intellectually developed tend to be physically weak or our phys their physical capacities gets limited because the energy goes into the mental development. On the other hand, those who are pretty much into physical development and the prowess of the body tend to be weaker in their mind. Finding a powerful intellectual mental development and a powerful physical bodily development is still an ongoing work. Very few individuals we see having such a solid combination. If we look at our current world heroes like Elon Musk, we see a robust intellectual capacity, a robust creative capacity of the mind, a strong mind, but also at the same time a strong vitality and a strong physique. The physical, vital, mental instrumentation is well developed, well integrated, and there is a growing awareness about the need to establish the balance of the body, the vitality, and the mental capacity. So more and more people who are in taking up the power of creative force and mental development are now consciously putting effort in developing the body, developing their vitality. Otherwise, traditionally, the tendency had been towards if you go into mental development, you lose your physical. If you go into the physical, you lose your mental. So a balance is yet to be established on a large scale, at a collective scale. Yet there is now a growing awareness and an attempt to bring this balance. Indeed, the increasing effort towards a more intense mental life seems to create frequently an increasing disequilibrium of the human elements. So, so that it is possible for eminent scientists to describe genius as a form of insanity that people with high level of unique mental capacities is often seen as a freak, a kind of form of insanity. The mad professor or a mad scientist. Now these are kind of uh, social stereotypes we see in the movies, in the novels. So that it is possible for eminent scientists to describe genius as a form of insanity a result of degeneration, a pathological morbidity of nature. Like nature pushes certain individuals to express a greater capacity of the mind. And many people who develop a high level of that intellectual development, mental development, tend to go also on the borderline of sanity. And in today's world, with the rapid expansion of mental capacities, also we see a growing epidemic of mental imbalance, mental health challenges, because the mental development is spreading like crazy everywhere. And unfortunately, education system is not yet an integral education that develops the body, the vitality as a foundation 
upon which the mind can safely develop its higher and higher levels of capacity. When this ground is not well prepared, we have a growing mental capacity, but the vessel in which it is developing cracks up. So the physical illnesses, mental illnesses, emotional imbalances have become more and more common in today's world. The phenomenon, the phenomena which are used to justify this exaggeration when taken not separately but in connection with all other relevant data point to a different truth. This phenomena of this things going out of balance. When we look at, it as, look at it in isolation, we may think that it is a degeneration, a disease. But when we look at the totality, where nature is pushing the mental development, and some individuals who are open to that force, open to that possibilities, stand out to be extraordinary, sometimes this imbalance. But when we look in the totality, it's actually the evolutionary process at work. And it is picking up individuals, pushing the limits, and establishing a template for the rest to follow. Genius is one attempt of the universal energy to so quicken the intensity of our intellectual powers. So here is explaining that. Genius is one attempt of the universal energy, E capital, energy. The universal energy of nature that is working through all of humanity is pushing people to cross the boundaries of normally established possibilities, normally established molds, and open to new ranges of cognition, intelligence, creative capacity, the genius is one attempt of the universal energy to so quicken and intensify our intellectual powers that they shall be prepared for those more puissant, direct, and rapid faculties which constitute the play of the supra-intellectual or divine mind. So we need to see from the perspective of there is these three levels, there are these three levels of the mind. The divine mind is yet to manifest. Intellectual mind is in the stage of development. In the bodily life that is well established, there is this mind that is involved in it, bound by it. So this evolving mind, mental capacity, nature is pushing and establishing that in a wider and wider population. At the same time, she is pushing some individuals who become these exceptional pioneers who are shooting to the higher range and opening that possibility of the divine mind and its ranges to be brought in and stabilized, brought into the human mold. So genius is one attempt of this universal energy to so quicken and intensify our intellectual powers that they shall be prepared for those more puissant, direct, and rapid faculties. Powerful, direct, and rapid faculties, much more rapid than the slow intellectual capacity, which constitute the play of the supra-intellectual or divine mind. So a genius like Nikola Tesla, for example, their mind was operating at a very different level. Ramanujam, his mind was operating at a different level. He could grasp profound mathematical truths intuitively. Then later, he intellectually labors to find the logical bridging, the systematic rational bridging of A to B, whereas he can intuitively grasp what is ahead. But the path to that is to be built logically where intellectual labor comes into the picture. But these are exceptional individuals in whom nature is pushing the boundaries and showing the possibility of human mind. What is possible for the human mind even within the human mold of bodily existence? It is not then a freak, an inexplicable phenomenon 
but a perfectly natural next step in the right line of her evolution. So in nature's evolution, she's picking up individuals and shooting forward. And as demonstration, prototyping spreads out, she can eventually push a whole larger groups towards a higher level of possibility. And that is her evolutionary movement. The current ongoing development of intellectual capacity, it is still in the making. She has harmonized the bodily life with the material mind. So the material mind, mind involved in matter. As Sherbindo has already mentioned, in a plant, mind is involved deeply. We don't see like a brain-like system. Whereas in animal, already it has emerged. And it is but bound. It is imprisoned. It works within the sensory limits. It is in human beings, that brain and the whole nervous system, within that framework, mind and intellect is able to free itself up. She has harmonized, nature has harmonized the bodily life with the material mind. That is, the bodily life has been very well established. She is harmonizing it with the play of the intellectual mentality. That is the current work that is ongoing. Still to find the right balance. For that, although it tends to, dis tends to a depression of the full animal and vital vigor. So here comes the challenge of if she is to balance that intellectual capacity in the process, she has to suppress some of the animal instincts and instinctual intelligence in human being. So that full animal and vital vigor, that strong vitality of the animal nature is suppressed so that intellectual man can emerge. She is harmonizing it with the play of the intellectual mentality. For that, although it tends to a depression, of the full animal and vital vigor need not produce active disturbance. So this development of the mind need not produce this disturbance. Once we understand this is what nature is attempting and our education system, understanding this complexity, adopt methodologies where the physical is well prepared, the life energy is well prepared, the solid ground is there, the vital physical envelopes are made capable of receiving and vigorously utilizing higher mental capacities, then this imbalance is not necessary. And this is what yoga is bringing in, is this heightened intellectual mental capacities can be brought in without disturbance. And she is shooting yet beyond the attempt to reach a still higher level. So nature is shooting up further and further, even beyond our intellectual range, beyond the mental range to a higher level. Nor are the disturbances created by her process as great as is often represented. We tend to look at this outstanding examples of disturbances and we exaggerate as that is the norm, but which is not the case. Nor are the disturbances created by her process as great as, it, as is often represented. Some of them are the crude beginnings of new manifestations. These are actually the signs of a new manifestation, what appears to be a disturbance, collective mental disturbance. Some of them are the crude beginnings of new manifestations. Others are an easily corrected movement of disintegration. So on one hand, there is a disintegration through exaggerated mental development in going in the wrong directions, falling into degenerative modalities. That can be corrected. Often fruitful of fresh activities and always a small price to pay for the far reaching result that she has in view. So these are prices nature is willing to pay. 
out of 9 billion people, she can happily push 1 billion or a million towards a new possibility, even at the cost of having disturbances in the collective life or the individual's life, because she is in the process of establishing a new harmony. And things can be corrected once we understand nature's intention, where she is heading, where she is pushing the evolution. So in today's world, there is a growing mental disorder, mental disharmony, and uh, it is also a signature, a sign that uh, something beyond mind is being attempted. Nature is pushing humanity towards something else, and we are losing balance, and we also need system of education, system of training, where the body, bodily life is made strong and capable of a higher intensity of mental activities without developing into this degeneration and disintegration and mental disorder. Because what we are sitting on is on an evolutionary possibility, an evolutionary crisis. The growing mental disorder is a signature that there is a rapid growth of the collective mind and a shooting beyond the human intellect and its are currently established possibilities. So that's what is ongoing. Let's move on to the next paragraph where he is opening a new perspective, a new window. We may perhaps if we consider all the circumstances, come to this conclusion that, what is that conclusion? Mental life, far from being a recent appearance in man, is the swift repetition in him of a previous achievement from which the energy in the race had undergone one of her deplorable recoils. Here, the window is open at a wide scale of human history. He is saying, what is currently happening as this rapid growth of the mind, mental life in humanity, and the related disturbances and all that. When we look at a larger span of history, when we consider all the circumstances come into this conclusion that mental life far from being recent appearance in man. There is a tendency to believe that our intellectual culture of the last 300 years, many believe, many tend to consider this as a linear progression in which this is a recent phenomenon. That is not the case. Intellectual development, the mental development has happened in the past, in previous cycles of human civilization. I already touched upon 1,500 years of development of intellectual culture in India, or the short period of the Greek civilization and its intellectual development. And we do not know how many cycles have gone before these ancient cycles. He's saying the that mental life, far from being a recent appearance in man, is the swift repetition, a swift repetition in him of a previous achievement. So we have achieved intellectual culture in preceding cycles. Therefore, we are able to swiftly repeat and regain the earlier gains. Previous achievement from which the energy in the race had undergone one of her deplorable recoils. The deplorable recoils. Nature rushes forward through this or that human grouping and then recoils. Often very painful recoil. So there had been many cycles according to Sri Aurobindo in the past. This mental development has been attempted, but human race has gone through a recoil. And right now, we are 
repeating and regaining the old attempts and what has been accomplished in the past. We are catching up again, once again, a new cycle. The savage is perhaps not so much the first forefather of civilized man. This is one of the modern uh, beliefs that older we look into history, what we see is more and more savage people. It is the modern man who is more civilized, advanced. Here Sri Aurobindo is saying, the savage is perhaps not so much the first forefather of civilized man as the degenerate descendant of a previous civilization. Possibly there were previous civilizations. Elsewhere in Sri Aurobindo's writings, he refers to, like in the current Indian civilization, the oldest available evidence of it is the Vedic civilization. He also refers to a pre-Vedic civilization a cycle that is lost in history. And Mother also confirms there was a pre-Vedic civilization, a civilization that reached very high level of development from where there was a decline and a fall back. So the savage is perhaps not so much the first forefather of civilized man as the degenerate descendant of a previous civilization. From a previous civilization, there was a degenerate descendancy that has happened. So what appears to be a savage is not really a savage. It is some recoil and deplorable recoil of nature in which race had fallen back. And now we are again re ascending to a new possibility. For if the actuality of intellectual achievement is unevenly distributed, it seems to be the case. Intellectual capacity is unevenly distributed across the races of the earth. The capacity is spread everywhere. The potentially the intellectual capacity is everywhere in humanity. It has been seen that in individual cases, even the racial type considered by us the lowest, the Negro, fresh from the perennial barbarism of Central Africa, is capable, without that mixture of blood, without waiting for future generations, of the intellectual culture, if not yet the intellectual accomplishment of the dominant European. In the present cycle of civilization, that intellectual development, the cycle began <clears throat> in Europe. With the European Renaissance and scientific revolution, the intellectual culture and its new cycle began and they became the protagonists of the present cycle. Whereas when we look at African continent, it is often considered as not intellectually developed, savage, but Sri Aurobindo is saying this is coming from an ancient previous cycle of civilization and descendant and people who are even when appears to be not intellectually developed, when given the right condition, <clears throat> even without going through multiple generations, are capable of bringing out that lost ability in its splendor. That's possible. And that's also an indication that what appears to be a savage is actually a degenerate descendant from a pre previous cycles of civilization. It has been seen that in individual cases, even the racial types considered by us the lowest, the Negro fresh from the perennial barbarism of Central Africa is capable without admixture of blood, without waiting for future generations of the intellectual culture, if not yet of the intellectual accomplishment of the dominant European. And in India itself, we could see that even though India declined in the last 500 years, by coming in contact with the European cycle of intellectual culture, the dormant intellectual capacity in India rose up, woke up. And we can see in the last century itself, many scientists 
and mathematicians like Ramanujam all rose up. Not just yogins of India who rose up, but profound intellectual capacity rose up because it was already there in India, dormant, it was waiting. And it just needed the right exposure and it flourishes, it comes back. So we can see now, even though India was in a very degenerate condition in the last two centuries, in today's world, in 21st century, Indians are rising to the leading positions, even leading companies like Google, Microsoft, we see Indians with great intellectual capacity, physical capacity, organizational ability, leadership capacities, all that. So even if human civilizations, groups go through the decline and recoils in the, from their previous cycles of greatness and achievement, they can rapidly recapture and ascend to a new height without even going through multiple generations. Within a single generation, it is possible to re-ascend into the heights of previous cycles of achievement. Even in the mass, men seem to need, in favorable circumstances, only a few generations. Even masses can move within few generations to cover ground that ought to apparently to be measured in terms of millenniums. So what would otherwise take millenniums to develop can be developed within few generations. If you just look at the last 300 years of scientific revolution and the accomplishments, the speed with which the transformation is happening, this is not happening because, or rather, it is happening because there were previous cycles in which accomplishments were done, after which nature had recoiled and degenerated, and we are regaining that lost cycles of possibility. And that makes it possible for within few generations, the ascension happening again. So even in the masses, men seem to need, in favorable circumstances, only a few generations to cover that ought to apparently to be measured in terms of millenniums. Either then, man by his privilege as a mental being is exempt from the full burden of the tardy laws of evolution. That is one possibility. Either man is exempted from the tardy laws of evolution, nature's subconscious evolution is very, very slow. Either man are given, people are given, human beings are given an exception, or else he already represents and with helpful conditions and in the right stimulating atmosphere can always display a high level of material capacity for the activities of the intellectual life. So, in the right conditions, he already has the possibilities. He already represents with the right helpful conditions and in the right stimulating atmosphere. He can always display a high level of material capacity for the activities of the intellectual life. So the potential is there and it can, it, this can rapidly emerge when there is a right condition. If we provide the right education, right climate, these latent potentialities would emerge swiftly, rapidly. It is not mental incapacity, but the long rejection or seclusion from opportunity. It is not mental incapacity, but the long rejection or seclusion from opportunity and withdrawal of the awakening impulse that creates the savage. The savage is a product of lost opportunities. Even what in India often referred to as the Adivasi, the primal dweller, is inheritor of ancient civilizational cycles and its potential. Under the right conditions and right support, the latent capacities can rapidly emerge in all. It is not 
mental incapacity, but the long rejection or seclusion from opportunity and withdrawal of the awakening impulse, withdrawal of the awakening impulse. Nature implants the impulse, not just in individuals, in groups, because we are part of nature's vast movement. When nature withdraws that impulse, that group also sinks down. That's what withdrawal of the awakening impulse. So the long rejection or seclusion from opportunity and withdrawal of the awakening impulse, that creates the savage. When the nature withdraws and chooses to let a particular race, a group to sink down, then that eventually degenerates and become the savage. Barbarism is an intermediate sleep, not an original darkness. Very profound line. Barbarism is an intermediate sleep, not an original darkness. We have to see this in the context of vast movement of nature's yoga, where she is rushing towards a higher achievement and she recoils and withdraws and she attempts in different parts of earth through different groupings of humanity. At one point she raises up the groups in Indian region, another time in China, another time in Greece, another time in Mesopotamia, another time in Egypt. She lifts up groups, brings them down. It is nature's vast impulse. And she's rushing towards a greater possibility, a greater synthesis. And barbarism is an intermediate stage. So in any given, given civilizational group, social grouping, there are cycles that they have gone through in the past. And even if a group appears to be in a very savage state, it is only an intermediate sleep, not an original darkness. Given the right conditions, the latent potential will rapidly bloom. It will not take many, many gener generations. In a very short time, it can bloom because it is already there. And the vast memory of nature carries these things. And once nature chooses a group, and move the group forward, flowering is certain and rapid. And the current <coughs> and the current cycle where it is from Europe, the awakening impulse rose up, intellectual culture rose up and started spreading across the world. Then it shifted to the US. Now it is shifting more and more to the Asian countries. There is a movement. Nature is shifting from one region to another region. She picks up one or other grouping to raise up and take things forward in her all comprehensive vision, which we humans don't see. But yogins see when yogins identify with the vaster movements of nature, one with the nature, so they can know what nature is anticipating, what nature is rushing forward, what is the will and force of nature and the divine will behind it. So with that, we end today's episode. Thank you. Next Wednesday, same time, 6 a.m. This will be released. Looking forward to get your feedback, suggestions, and subscribe to the channel so that you get the notifications. Thank you.